the tail on the clock is a uh, mechanism of mitochondrial membrane fusion, um, and hopefully by the end you'll you'll understand what that means. Um, but I figure, you know, being the eclectic nature of the crowd that I would start at the beginning, and in this case the beginning is the origin of life. So some four billion years ago, um, the first cell uh, was thought to arise in a membrane um, bound compartment, and many evolutionary biologists believe that that cell uh, went on to to generate of the three uh, kingdoms of, of life that we know today, um, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Um, now, bacteria and archaea, see, that's why I'm glad I didn't have the pen in, because I would have just advanced the slide after that. Uh, bacteria and archaea um, are also known as prokaryotes, and they, um, they make up an incredibly diverse array of life on the planet Earth um, that is necessary for, for us eukaryotes to survive. Um, but they're generally uh, much more simple um, in organization and structure as far as their cell, and they're usually much smaller. Um, whereas eukaryotes um, can be quite large, uh, they, they also comprise, they're, they're very complex, and they comprise multicellular organisms such as us. Um, they, are, they have many membrane-bound compartments in the cells, they're, they have specialized function, um, including uh, the nucleus, uh, which is the hallmark of, of eukaryotes and separates its genetic material from the rest uh, of the cell. And as you can see, uh, not only is it much more complex um, than prokaryotes, uh, but uh, size-wise it's much bigger. So this is a still from a, a famous movie from the 1950s where a white blood cell chases down and engulfs a bacterium. And here the bacterium is, is circled in blue. And you can see how tiny it is compared to the white blood cell. And then uh, the red circle is a red blood cell, and there's some platelets here in this, in this panel as well. But you can see that uh, eukaryotic cells uh, are much larger um, than their prokaryotic uh, counterparts. And they also are very, uh, in multicellular organisms, they're very specialized. So, you know, how, how is this kind of complexity and size difference generated? Well, eukaryotes um, have expanded their genetic material 200,000 fold above that of prokaryotes, so they have much bigger um, genomes which allow for a lot more innovation. Um, but as you can imagine, increasing your genetic material by that much um, comes at an energetic cost. Um, so what, what, what really happens here? Um, eukaryotes had to be able to acquire uh, a system for generating energy. Um, evidence indicates that at this point in evolution, uh, of endosymbiotic event occurred where a bacterium and likely a, an anaerobic archaea um, progenitor uh, combined to form eukary the eukaryotic line. So um, what I'm talking about here is mitochondria. Mitochondria are derived from bacteria. They have many similar features to bacteria. Um, it is thought that a bacterium was engulfed by a progenitor to eukaryotes and then it became specialized uh, for energy production. So many of the, the features that mitochondria have in common uh, with their bacterial ancestors is they have two, <coughs> two membranes. They retain their own genome, as well as the machinery to replicate, transcribe, and translate uh, products from that genome. Um, and they're specialized for aerobic uh, energy production. All right. So during the evolution of mitochondria, uh, they, their genome has undergone a lot of change. For one thing, uh, it's, it's very small. It's, it's almost a remnant of what it once was. Uh, most of the uh, genetic material from the pro proteobacterial ancestor has been lost. Um, uh, the mitochondrial genome in humans only encodes for 13 proteins. Um, however, mitochondria uh, contain well over 1,100 proteins. And most of these proteins, most of the proteome of the mitochondria are actually encoded by um, the nuclear genome. Now, many of these proteins actually came from the proteobacterial ancestor through uh, gene transfer to the nucleus. However, a, a good many of these genes uh, came through horizontal gene transfer from other bacterial species, as well as uh, quite, a, quite a bit of uh, eukaryotic innovations. Um, one of the eukaryotic innovation, innovations that allowed uh, the nuclear material of the, of the ancestor to, to be uh, translocated to the nucleus was um, the ability to import um, proteins that are translated in the cytoplasm 
into the mitochondria. Um, so that's a key um, eukaryotic innovation, um, as well as as well as a few others. Um, but what you know, the, the majority of the proteome that's encoded by the nucleus, what that allows the cell to do is coordinate the uh, the behavior of mitochondria with uh, extracellular cues that the cell senses or metabolic needs. Um, so it really kind of controls the, the mitochondria through this kind of um, genetic landscape. So, you know, comparing the mitochondrial genome, in humans it's only 16,000 base pairs. Uh, most of the genome encodes uh, essentially the translation machinery, so two ribosomal RNAs and 22 transfer RNAs that read, uh, that read a genetic code that's actually slightly different than the nuclear genomic code. Um, and, and, it only, and, and all this uh, goes to uh, producing 13 polypeptides that are, that are uh, specialized, or, or they're part of the respiratory complex and important for energy production. And it's thought um, that the reason why you have these remnant genomes of mitochondria is you need that genetic material close to the bioenergetic membranes um, for proper uh, feedback and, and uh, coordination of uh, protein production with uh, energetics in the, in the inner membrane. So if you compare this genome, you know, it's only 16,000 base pairs. Well, the smallest uh, human chromosome, in this case uh, chromosome 21, is 47 million base pairs. So you can see you know, how, how lean this, this mitochondrial genome has become. However, uh, unlike the nuclear genome, where you only have two pairs of each chromosome, one for your mom and one from your dad, there's approximately one to 5,000 uh, copies of your mitochondrial genome throughout your cells. So whereas this thing is small in size, um, that, allows, you know, that allows it not much energetic penalty to replicate this genome and propagate it many, many times throughout the cell. And that allows for a large, uh, a large amplification in the amount of energy that, that the mitochondria can produce compared to its proteobacterial ancestor. And that energy excess is what allows uh, eukaryotic complexity. Um, you have this energetic cost um, from expanding your genome and the mitochondria. Uh, this innovation is what, what produces that energy that allows it to happen. So how do mitochondria produce energy? I imagine many of you are familiar uh, with this kind of, this kind of uh, system. You have, in fact, this over here too. You have this intermediary metabolism pathways um, that uh, are important for converting, uh, you know, things like carbohydrate proteins and, and carbohydrates and fats uh, into energy. Um, and how it does this is these guys go through, um, you know, these intermediary pathways in the cytosol um, to produce uh, things like pyruvate. Um, which then go into the mitochondria, uh, participate in the TCA cycle, and uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, it produces uh, a lot more ATP than uh, just the glycolysis cycle. So you convert, you know, every day you convert approximately your body weight uh, in ATP a day, I and mean, that's how much ATP your mitochondria are churning out um, constantly. So it's a pretty impressive uh, energy synthesizing machine. So, you know, through this metabolism, uh, you get these powerful um, reducing compounds like NADH or FADH, uh, and it store a lot of potential energy. And the respiratory complex on the inner membrane of the mitochondria um, shuttle electrons from these reduced agents through the respiratory complex, um, you know, releasing this potential energy and using it to drive protons across this, this membrane. And this set up some sets up a large uh, voltage difference across this membrane. And eventually, uh, these electrons are taken from this donor uh, all the way to the final receptor, which is molecular oxygen, and turns into water. And that's a process we call respiration. Um, so the movement of electrons and protons uh, generate a transmembrane potential of around 150 to 200 millivolts. So on the size scale of, of say, us, that's about, that's about the size of a bolt of lightning. That's how much uh, electrical potential is being put across this membrane. Um, and my country uses uh, electrical potential to drive the world's smallest rotary engine. So uh, protons uh, flow through this rotary engine 
um, that creates this rotational motion and these conformational changes um, here uh, in the head um, are, har are harnessed uh, to drive a very energetically unfavorable reaction in the conversion of ADP to ATP. And those ATP molecules, um, because they, they harness so much potential energy in the cell, they're used to drive a lot of other um, energetically unfavorable reactions uh, by, by converting ATP to ADP. Um, and that ATP is essentially the energy currency that the cell uses um, for most of its non-equilibrium uh, chemical reactions. So my, mitochondria are highly compartmentalized um, organelles. <coughs> the inner membrane of the mitochondria where, uh, where this ATP production happens um, is greatly expanded to increase the surface area of the inner membrane. This is another way that you get amplification of the amount of ATP that this organelle can generate compared to its ancestors. Um, you see you also have a very specialized structure. For instance, uh, the boundary membrane region and contact sites between the outer and inner membranes um, are specialized uh, for lipid and protein transport from the outer to the inner membrane. Um, whereas cristae, with these invaginations, um, are specialized to, uh, to increase the, uh, the pH difference from the outer, from the matrix to the inner membrane space side. And this is where a lot of your respiratory complexes and your ATP synthase particles all assemble in these cristae. And you have, uh, and you have, you see here, your mitochondrial DNA are closely associated with these cristae structures so that they're close to the energy um, producing region. So this, this, sorry, yeah. this baffle model, uh, which is popular in textbooks to show because it shows the invaginations of the um, inner membrane, and it kind of comes from these, it's a model based on these micrographs. Um, but when we do uh, three-dimensional tomography, um, we actually see that this baffle uh, model isn't exactly correct. Um, you see, you see tightly packed uh, inner membranes, uh, but these cristae actually form these large cisterni um, this is where all ATP production happens, and, and they're only actually um, contacting the, the boundary membranes through these small uh, cristae junction, um, which you can see below up here, these cristae junction uh, regions. And, and this is a, a very specialized structure that allows, uh, the basic, it's basically a diffusion barrier from the cristae to the uh, intermembrane space between the boundary region and the outer membrane. And that's important. Uh, it's important to, to, to uh, you know, really generate the membrane voltages that you want. And it's also important because a lot of the um, energy generating machinery is cytotoxic, meaning it's really toxic to the, to the cytoplasm. And one of the early events you see in intrinsic apoptosis is actually remodeling of these cristae junctions to open up and let some of these cytotoxic molecules out, um, especially cytochrome C, which is, uh, which is important for the electron transport chain. When these cristae junctions open up and cytochrome C is released, that is a commitment step to killing that cell um, when, these, when these mitochondria do that. Um, a little aside, and I just want to sum up uh, some of the main points of this part of the intro. Uh, mitochondria are derived from ba bacteria via endo endosymbiosis. Um, they're pivotal, pivotal in the evolution of eukaryotes. They have their own genome. Uh, they create a, a large voltage or a proton motor force for ATP synthesis. And uh, one thing I didn't talk about is they are essential for human health. So a lot of um, age-related diseases have been tied to mutations in both the mitochondrial genome and in nu and nuclear encoded uh, mitochondrial proteins that, uh, that that make this organelle function uh, less efficiently. All right, and and they can't survive alone. I mean, they they've been stripped down to the point that they're only semi-autonomous. They do replicate themselves, but they cannot be made de novo, and, and they, cannot, uh, they cannot live outside the cell. So, a lot of what I showed you is depicted pretty classically in uh, textbooks, you know, these bean-shaped organelles with the, with the highly complex inner membranes. But, uh, you know, one thing that people don't really appreciate is that mitochondria actually usually um, exist oftentimes in a single continuous organelle in a very reticular uh, connected network. 
here's a human cell and here is a, a yeast. Um, you can see uh, the mitochondrial um, organelle is, you know, there's, it's not discontinuous, it's very continuous uh, with multiple nucleoids distributed throughout the, throughout the network. Um, so you have a, a good uh, distribution of energy production throughout the cell. Um, but one of the things that the interconnected network uh, does for the mitochondria is it allows it to be highly responsive to changes in either metabolic need or to signals from the, from the uh, nucleus. Um, you can imagine if you, if you had uh, many different mitochondria fragments in a cell, you know, they're going to be experiencing signals uh, in different ways quantitatively. But as a single interconnected uh, network, um, they're going to be able to respond uh, uh, more co in a more coordinated fashion. So the network uh, can uh, share contents. Um, it remains distributed, and uh, you know, and it can change in, in response to metabolic needs. So this this complex mitochondrial structure uh, is maintained by a balance of division and fusion events. Um, and one thing you see is when you block fusion, uh, you get an overstimulated division. You get a fragmented mitochondrial network, more in the classical way of. Uh, People have thought about mitochondria. Um, however, if you overstimulate fusion uh, or block division, you get a very highly connected network that forms this kind of net, net like morphology. Um, and whereas in certain circumstances this can actually be protected to the cell, um, it's no longer as well distributed, so you have uh, energy zone you know, depletion and you get uh, impaired uh, inheritance um, because of the the less distributed network. So we found many genes in yeast, and uh, likewise later on in, in mammal, in mammalian cells, um, that participate both in fusion and in division. <coughs> All these proteins, when mutated, um, shift this balance. Um, and so, you know, like I said, when you get uh, overstimulated division or unopposed division, you get a fragmented uh, mitochondrial network, and you get stochastic inheritance of this mitochondrial network. And over time, in a very short time, I might add, um, you get a loss of the mitochondrial DNA. They're just not inherited properly. So uh, as, a, for instance, a yeast colony grows, um, it very quickly, um, most of the yeast cells lose the mitochondrial genomes. And thus, they can no longer respire. Um, likewise, if you block division and get this, uh, this, this highly connected network, you see an increased loss of, of mitochondrial DNA, but it's not nearly as severe as when you block fusion. So um, division and fusion are, are required um, to, to, uh, to maintain this, this nucleoid distribution throughout the cell and in proper inheritance. Um, so one thing I want to tell you about next is many of these proteins, uh, interestingly, DNM1 and MGM1 and FZO1 are all uh, dynamic related GTPases. So what are, what are ERPs, or dynamic-related GTPases? Well, they're large GTPases. Uh, unlike signaling GTPases, um, which generally are small, um, and also signaling GTPases usually use GAFs or GAPs to, to uh, regulate um, their GTPA cycle or their GTP hydrolysis cycle. Dynamic GTPases um, actually assemble into structures um, through through this, uh, these modular domains. And, and that assembly is what stimulates GTP hydrolysis. So it's different from signaling GTPases in that way. Um, but another difference is the fact that uh, these GTPases are mechanoenzymes, so they're motor proteins. They're actually bending membranes or, or, or uh, dividing membranes or fusing membranes. Okay? So. So how do these uh, mitochondrial DRPs mediate uh, membrane division or fusion? So DNM1 uh, forms these helical structures that are tailored to constrict mitochondria, meaning uh, the diameter that this protein uh, forms these helical structures is the same diameter um, as constricted mitochondria, so they, so they fit uh, just geometrically. And through a lot of biochemistry and genetics I'm not going to show you, um, we worked out a, a general cycle for how, how the GTPase works in dividing membranes. Um, it, it exists as dimers, um, which is in flux, uh, forming these uh, larger structures. Uh, it targets to a membrane, 
Uh, it forms helical structures, which, which gives you some constriction. When you, when you bind GTP, you get uh, a, a certain amount of constriction. Um, when, you, when you hydrolyze the GDP and release GDP and the uh, inorganic phosphate, um, you, you constrict it further and actually pinch uh, this tubule off. And that's, and that's essentially how you get membrane uh, division. Okay? Um, so I want to show you a structure. So this was solved. This is the structure of Dynamin 1, which is a, a highly related, uh, well, it's essentially a, the archetype of the Dynamin uh, superfamily of GTPases. Solved by a postdoc in our lab, Ren Ford. Um, and essentially, I just want to show you how this domain architecture works out. Uh, this GTPS domain, which has the active site for GTP hydrolysis, forms a globular domain here. Uh, there's an N-terminal and C-terminal um, helices that uh, bind the very C-terminus of this so-called GED domain uh, that form a three-helix bundle that people will call the bundle signaling element. And this bundle uh, actually changes orientation through the GTP hydrolysis cycle, and that's what's giving you a kind of this power stroke um, that happens for these motor proteins. Uh, the middle domain and the internal of the GED domain uh, fold together uh, to make this long stalk, and this is where um, this is where the assembly of these structures is happening. This is the assembly region of the protein, and then you have a uh, oftentimes called insert B in this case, a pH domain. This is a domain that's highly variable among all the DRPs that binds lipid, that binds their special target membranes, and uh, and, and affects the the membrane uh, remodeling. So the solid domain has three interfaces, uh, interface two, interface one, and interface three. Uh, one and three um, uh, interact uh, with other uh, dynamic one particles to form these large, uh, these large structures. Interface two is the dimerization interface, which I'll just show you here. So it dimerizes through the stock domain through, uh, through interface two. And the other interface is participate in higher order assembly. And once this thing is fully assembled into a helical run, you'll see. <laughs> uh, once it's assembled into a helical run, uh, two GTPase domains are brought together and interface together, and the GTP binding um, site is uh, in this interface. And this is how the GTP hydrolysis by these molecules is stimulating. So once you get one full run, you stimulate GTP hydrolysis by this pair of of GTP uh, ACE domains. And that leads to conformational chaining that, that pinch off the tubule. So I've told you a little bit about how the division machinery works. Um, next, I want to tell you about how the fusion machinery works, uh, specifically about how the inner membrane fusion machinery works and how it's adapted to mediate uh, inner membrane fusion. Um, so interestingly, the the inner membrane fusion DRP, MGM1, exists at steady state in uh, two isoforms um, generated uh, post-translationally by a proteolytic cleavage event in the inner membrane. Um, the long isoform contains a, uh, a transmembrane domain and is an integral membrane protein that's always docked into the um, inner membrane, whereas the short isoform uh, uh, is missing this transmembrane direct domain and is soluble in principle, but it's a peripheral membrane protein. It still binds membrane. And interestingly, it binds membranes um, by this insert B region, whereas the long uh, is tethered to the membrane here at the transmembrane, uh, kind of oriented in an opposite, in opposite uh, orientation to the short. When you, uh, when you mutate MGM1, you can see that you get these septated membranes. Um, whereas the outer membrane here has been fused, um, you had failure of fusion of just the inner membrane. So what are the roles of these two different isoforms of membrane fusion? Um, here I'm using yeast as a model system. And using a, a matrix targeted GFP, uh, you can visualize these mitochondrial networks. And here you can see in, in, in a wild type where we have an engineered copy of long and an engineered copy of short. So we can separate these two isoforms by engineering the cleavage sites and reintroduce them separately. Uh, and when you get them both together, um, you get a reticular network. Each one alone, uh, you, don't, you don't get that. You get a fragmented network. So both isoforms are required uh, for, for mitochondrial fusion. 
if you mute, if you mutate just the long axis form uh, in the GTPase so domain, so that it no longer hydrolyzes G GTP, so you knock out the, the GTPase uh, activity of the long, you can see it has little effect on the, on the morphology. You still get a connected network. However, if you do the same for just the short isoform, uh, you get a fragmented network. And of course, when they're both mutated, um, you still get a fragmented network. But interestingly, only the short um, isoform, uh, only GTPase activity by the short isoform is required, um, which makes the long isoforms function kind of enigmatic. Um, in vitro, if we purify short, um, we can see uh, how it interacts with lipids. So in this flotation assay, um, what we do is we load uh, uh, short MGM1 with liposomes, and we uh, create a sucrose gradient, and we spin the sucrose gradient. Because the liposomes are less dense than the sucrose gradient, they float to the top. However, protein generally is more dense than the sucrose gradient, and it pellets to the bottom. So only if uh, protein can associate with the uh, liposomes will it float to the top. And that's what we see here. Um, here, here's the short. Um, you can see it pellets to the bottom, and liposomes that, that uh, contain 0% uh, of this cardiolipin lipid. Um, however, in an inner membrane content liposomes, where there's 20% cardiolipin, you see uh, quite a bit of, of flotation. And you can see a good bit of flotation at just 6%. Um, so short uh, MGM1 can associate with lipids, but it associates in a cardiolipin-dependent fashion. Uh, which is important because cardiolipin uh, is a lipid that's specific for the inner membrane of mitochondria. It only occurs there. You don't see it in the plasma membrane or the ER or peroxisomes or anywhere else. Um, and, that kind of, and that kind of restricts uh, the short uh, isoforms um, um, location and activity just in the inner membrane. Um, interestingly, this lipid also stimulates GTPase activity. So if we look at GTPase activity, um, in the presence of liposomes with 20% cardiolipin, uh, we, see, we see activity, however, in 0%, uh, it has very little activity um, because it's not binding these liposomes, and apparently the lipid and the liposomes is, uh, is activating this protein, so uh, GTPase um, activity. All right, just one more biochemistry slide, and we'll be through this part. Um, also, interestingly, uh, here you see the short activity. Um, in the presence of long, you actually get a stimulation of activity. Um, so whereas long uh, doesn't hydrolyze, it doesn't even seem to bind GTP uh, in our hands through data I'm not showing you here, uh, it can stimulate uh, the activity of short. So we think what is happening is the cardiolipin and the long isoform that is integral to the inner membrane um, serve as like a proofreading mechanism for the short isoform activity, which is performing fusion. Um, so if we look at what uh, the short isoform looks like when it binds membranes, uh, we find that it actually forms this uh, two-dimensional crystalline array of dimers. So in this case, uh, in this reconstruction, you see the dimers kind of arrayed in either a, a six-fold or a three-fold symmetry. Um, but it's definitely not forming helical structures. And we think that this array is actually um, is what's interfacing two opposing uh, inner membranes during the fusion reaction. This is an early stage, we think. So um, let me just summarize um, here. So what are the distinguishing uh, features that specify uh, division and fusion activities between these dynamic related proteins? Uh, similarities, you know, they both self-assemble. They have a cooperative GTP hydrolysis, and they have a similarly stimulated GTP hydrolysis. Uh, but the, here's the differences. Uh, this division uh, machine uh, forms helical structures, and uh, one thing I didn't show you is it also has uh, adapter proteins that it binds that both target it to the membrane and are, are uh, necessary to help it divide the membrane. Whereas MGM1 uh, forms these order 2D arrays um, in its assembly state, uh, it has two isoforms and is, is, is regulated by this uh, inner membrane lipid cardiolipid. So our hypothesis is that it's the organization of these DRP structures uh, via maybe the stock domain that specifies the membrane division and fusion machinery. So it's the geometry of the assemblies uh, that are they're really specifying whether it divides or it fuses membranes. Okay, so one of the things uh, I'm going to, or I should say, the thing I'm going to tell you about today, one of the things I did 
was we took a structure function analysis of the MGM1 stock domain. Um, and essentially here, we're just going to be doing mutations and deletions in the stock domain and see how it affects uh, MGM1 activity. And here's uh, how we're going to analyze that. Um, so the kind of the dogma of MGM1 is that it's important for uh, mitochondrial network morphology for connectedness. And that is important for uh, proper inheritance of mitochondrial DNA. And which is in turn uh, important, important for respiration. And how we're going to look at this is we're going to look at uh, matrix targeted fluorescent proteins, look at morphology. Uh, we're going to do DAPI staining so you can see you can see the nuclear DNA here, and you can see these little dots. These are the, the, the nucleoids, the mitochondrial genomes. We're going to see if those are present. And uh, we can actually force yeast. Yeast actually prefer to ferment their carbon sources uh, if they had the chance. So if you give them glucose, they're really not going to do a lot of respiration. They're mostly going to ferment that glucose. Um, However, if you, if you try and grow them on a non-fermentable carbon source, such as glycerol or ethanol, um, they, they no longer ferment that carbon source, so they have to rely on respiration uh, to be able to use that carbon source for energy. And so uh, this is just a quick panel just to show, um, in this case, uh, here's a strain that can, that can respire and it can grow on this carbon source, and here's a strain that can't respire, and then you see basically no growth. All right. Um, so one thing you know we want to do when we're when we're targeting this uh, the stock <coughs> domain is we won't, we don't want to hit anything that's going to really affect folding of this domain. And so um, the first thing we want to do is create uh, a structural model of NGM1. And as you can see, uh, all these DRP um, clades are all uh, actually fusion DRPs. And here are the scission clade, and it's pretty tight. Um, this model that I showed you, or the structure that was solved, is this rat uh, dynamic one. Here, and you see MGM1 is the most closely related to, to the decision clay, so we think it's going to be a good model. And when we run uh, homology models um, through uh, different servers and software packages, um, we get similar results, and that is that this dynamic one structure um, comes up as a really good hit for us. And uh, in this case, uh, this Fire 2 server gave us a 98.7% confidence that the structural model is correct. Um, and this is what we base a lot of our mutagenesis on. So here, let me show you what the model of NG1 looks like. Very similar to the Dynamic 1, because that's the template. You have the globular GTPH domain, a bundle signaling element here. Um, you have this uh, GAD and middle domain folded together to make a stock. In this case, uh, it's not a pH domain, but you have a variable region here um, that we have actually isolated and it is responsible for the cardiolipin-dependent lipid association. So we know that that, that that is actually a good prediction of that. Um, so we targeted, so, so our goal is to target um, this region with mutations. Uh, this is a previously uncharacterized region of MGM1. <coughs> Most mutations to date uh, have all been in the GTPH domain. All right. So this is just a structural model again on the left. The structural model is colored um, based on uh, homology of all the fungal uh, MGM1 and MSP1 proteins. Where dark is the most uh, most conserved residues and light is the least conserved residues, and you can kind of get an idea of what parts of the proteins are conserved and unconserved. And you see here around the GTP uh, hydrolysis active site, you get a lot of conservation as you would expect. You have uh, just a few islands of conservation on this side of the stock, and some in the insert B here. Um, however, on the other side, in this bundle signaling element, and on the back side of the stock domain. Which is, which is about where you would expect uh, interface two, the dimerization interface. Um, you see a, a good bit of a homology on this side. However, when we uh, started targeting this for mutagenesis and we started looking at the effects of these things, um, here in green are residues we mutated that essentially had no effect on MGM1 activity, which was the majority of mutations we made. And in fact, here on this back side where it's well conserved, a lot of these mutations had, had no effect. Um, however, on, on this on this interface, which isn't used in the, in the division dy dynamics and DRPs, um, a lot of the mutations we made on this side, uh, especially in this conserved cluster here, um, actually disrupted MGM1 function. So we think what we found here, just through this simple um, approach, is a, is a novel uh, assembly interface or maybe dimerization interface on um, this specific to fusion fusion DRPs. Um, so more information we can get out of this. 
Um, so this is kind of, you know, like I said, this is kind of dogma. Uh, you know, we expect tubular morphology um, to be related to to, uh, to mitochondrial genome maintenance or transmission in this case. And as you see, there's a, there's a pretty good correlation between uh, how much uh, mitochondrial DNA is, is retained in, in cells and uh, how uh, interconnected the network of, uh, of uh, these cells are. So these all represent uh, different mutations. Here you see a cluster. These are all the really deleterious mutations we made that completely knock out MGM1 function. And you see we get a good range of, uh, of, uh, of intermediate effects. Um, here I'm going to come back to this one. This is a particular mutation we're going to talk about in a little bit, um, which is pretty interesting. You see that it also um, kind of follows this general trend of, uh, of uh, how interconnected the networks are and how well they maintain their genomes. Um, here is where it gets pretty interesting. Uh, you actually see a, a tighter correlation even from, uh, from uh, how many cells maintain genomes um, compared to how many cells that can respire. Uh, which makes sense. I mean, if you have mitochondrial genomes, you should be able to respire, and if you don't have mitochondrial genomes, you're not going to be able to respire. Um, however, we did find this one mutation uh, that I showed you earlier um, that maintains mitochondrial DNA, but it is completely uh, devoid of uh, any ability to, to grow on non fermentable carbon sources um, or to respire by other assays that we, that we put it through. Um, this mutation actually um, clusters close to this. This little uh, patch here that we thought was an interface, which is kind of interesting. Um, maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a regulatory um, regulatory uh, residue. Um, so we wanted to explore this further. You know, you know what's what's going on here. Um, it kind of upsets the dogma, which is always a fun thing in biology. Uh, so the next thing we wanted to test for this for this mutation is uh, whether or not it could fuse a uh, mitochondria. In this case, what we do is we take a population of yeast and uh, label their mitochondria uh, with, say, a GFP. Um, we take a population and we label it uh, with a different color, DS red, and their opposite mating types. We allow them to mate. The cells fuse. Um, the two mitochondrial networks encounter each other. And if, if, uh, if they can fuse, um, you'll get content mixing. So you'll get an overlap of these, of these uh, two fluorescent signals. Uh, here you see a uh, delta MGM1 where we add back a wild type MGM1. Uh, you see uh, a pretty interconnected network, um, and you see that it can uh, do the contents mixing. If we just put in an empty vector, so it's just a delta MGM1, you see that these, uh, these mitochondrial networks do come together and make a lot of contact, but they actually uh, do no content mixing, so they do no, uh, no fusion of the matrix. Um, Whereas this mutation um, actually is really connected, and it does do um, almost a wild type level amount of uh, content mixing. So you know, as the uh, morphology of this mutant suggested, you know, it being interconnected, that it can perform a mitochondrial fusion. Um, so you know, so what is the role in MGM1 in maintaining respiratory continent independent of its inner membrane uh, fusion activity? So what's going on here? So, you know, one thing we would want to do is say, well, you know, we know that it has nucleoids, but are these nucleoids, uh, are they functional? You know, are there big deletions in the nucleoid? Is there something wrong with them? You know, can they, can they uh, actually work? So, um, so the first thing we tried is we took this mutation and we added back, after, after it could no longer respire, we added back a wild type copy of MGM1 on top of it. And as you can see, uh, we can regain the ability um, of, of, this, uh, set up, of these cells to grow on a non fermentable carbon source. So we can, we can return it um, to respiration, which suggests that the mitochondrial DNA that is present is functional once you get this wild type copy back in. Um, also, if we look at, in this mutation, um, this is a, a reverse transcription uh, assay where you just reverse transcribe. Um, transcripts of the mitochondrial genome, in this case COX-1, which is part of one of the respiratory complexes. Here you see in wild type, uh, you, you have uh, COX-1 being transcribed, and so is the case uh, uh, for this mutant. However, in a delta MGM-1, which is lost nucleoid, of course, you, you're not getting any transcription, which is a good control. Um, there's no mitochondrial DNA there. So, you know, mitochondrial DNA that is present in these cells is functional as being actively transcribed. 
So maybe there's something wrong with uh, the protein synthesis. Um, and that's exactly what we see. In this case, um, we label protein synthesis with uh, S35 um, labeled methionine. So uh, a radioactive methionine that gets incorporated into the synthesizing proteins. Um, and we do it in the presence of cyclohexamide, which halts uh, protein synthesis in the cytosol. So we're only looking at protein, protein synthesis in the mitochondria because mitochondrial ribosomes being from a different origin of the cytoplasmic ribosomes aren't, uh, aren't sensitive to cyclohexamide. So, so we specifically see um, um, mitochondrial ribosome dependent uh, protein synthesis and in the wild type you get that synthesis uh, both in the vector, which lacks mitochondrial DNA and in this mutant which is transcribing but is no longer being able to translate um, these proteins. So we're getting a protein translation defect. Um, and when we fractionate mitochondrial ribosomes from isolated mitochondria on a sucrose gradient, you know, we can see you, you can resolve the, the small and the large particle and, and the 70S uh, together particle of mitochondrial ribosomes and when the wild type NGM1 is present. However, you, you start to lose or you've lost uh, these, these, mitoc these ribosomal particles in both the mutant and in the empty vector. Um, so we're getting a ribosome assembly defect uh, in this mutant. So, you know, again, the next step, well, what, you know, what is NGM1 doing for ribosome biogenesis? Um, and so for this, um, one of the things we look at is, well, what do we know about ribosome biogenesis, especially in the mitochondria? Well, we know that ribosomes are, are heavily associated with the inner membrane. Uh, we know that the inner membrane is necessary to assemble uh, ribosome particles. Um, so, so next we want to look at inner membrane structure. So in this, in this mutation, well here you see um, in the presence of wild type, this is uh, what a typical yeast mitochondria looks like. Um, basically you see a lot of cristae, a lot of, uh, a lot of inner membrane structure here, a lot of short cristae. Um, in the absence of NGM1, actually usually you lose all inner membrane structure um, completely. Um, so you see no inner membrane structure. Um, however, in this meat, you see a drastically um, altered inner membrane structure. So you're not getting as many cristae, but you're getting these long cristae. Um, oftentimes, you're getting a lot of septated inner membrane, um, which is interesting because we know that it can do fusion. And you get uh, you know, a lot of these uh, cristae that don't seem to have a, a terminus um, or maybe a flat sheet. Um, so a lot of altered uh, inner membrane morphology. And we think that this inner membrane morphology um, difference is what is, uh, is what is causing a loss of ribosomes, um, which is pretty interesting because most uh, mutations to mitochondrial ribosomes are actually um, very, very deleterious. So usually you get fragmented networks, really harsh effects. Um, so this is one of the few uh, mutations that have ever um, had an effect on mitochondrial ribosome assembly that's been, you know, this mild. Um, all right. So just give you a quick summary. Um, MGM1 is structure related to division DRPs. It assembles into unique structures. Um, the stop domain uh, may contain a novel uh, assembly interface. And MGM1 is important for intermembrane uh, organization and mitochondrial ribosome biogenesis, which seems to be distinct from its uh, mitochondrial fusion um, activities. Maybe I should just stop here and take questions. I have a whole other section, it's pretty cool, but. <laughs>